A hundred shots fired outside a recording studio near Queen and Dufferin last night. Nearly two dozen people are arrested and 16 guns have been seized. And the city's committing to a hiring plan for police officers. We'll have the details of the plan coming up. And we are live outside Rogers Centre. It's the first day fans can buy merch from Taylor Swift's Eras Tour ahead of the first show on Thursday. This is Live at Five. Good evening, I'm Bakari Savage. And I'm Lena Latifat. Thank you for joining us here on Live at Five. Police have seized more than a dozen firearms and arrested 23 people after a wild shoot near Queen and Dufferin. It happened outside a recording studio, and by chance, police were in the area when the gunfire erupted. I see between the force crime analyst Steve Ryan joins us live with details of the story. Steve, you've been working on this story all day. Yeah, that's right, Bakari. And uh, sadly, we are seeing another uh, blatant disregard for public safety in a very uh, high-end uh, trafficked area, both vehicle traffic and uh, pedestrian traffic as well. We're on the north side of Queen near North Cope. The location where this all started was this recording studio, which is in this building we're going to show you right now. And as we've been reporting, and as you guys have said, the police seized 16 firearms last night, arrested 23 people, and there were 100 shots fired and miraculous. Actually, nobody was injured. So it was some fantastic police work. Very brave men and women who stepped in to affect these arrests. And uh, we, we are going to show you a video that was provided to me today. Somebody captured um, video on their phone of the gunshots being fired. It certainly was a big concern for people in the neighborhood here as they're still trying to deal with what happened last night. We did hear from uh, the police chief who spoke at the police services board meeting today. He addressed this issue and I talked to a witness as well who uh, saw this from her apartment window last night. Here's more from the two of them. There were dozens of shots fired between the two parties. So far, 16 guns have been seized, including handguns and rifles, and 23 people have been arrested. This investigation is ongoing. These events highlight the importance of the law reform we asked for in the past. Gunfire in our public spaces must be recognized for the harm it causes, not just for those involved directly, but for bystanders and the public at large. Scary. I mean, you know, this is kind of, I would say, a pretty much safe neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I'm around here all the time with my business and just also just doing personal errands and living around here. And it's, it's just terrifying, you know, it's like a hor horrific experience. Just to add to what the chief was saying there, many police leaders have said to me that they want to see stiffer penalties when it comes to gun crimes and keeping those in custody who are out on several bails for committing the same sort of violent crimes. The recidivism rate when it comes to those committing these crimes is extraordinary and the police are met with uh, these same individuals time and time again. So sentencing is not just about punishment because when you sentence somebody for a violent crime with a gun, the damage is done. Somebody's already injured, both either physically or psychologically. It's about deterring others from committing the same crime to prevent uh, other potential victims. And lastly, the argument of that mandatory sentencing for gun crimes, um, we don't have that here for the most part, and that's because every crime is unique and every criminal comes with their own baggage. But what I would argue, what many have argued, is that even though each crime is unique and the set of circumstances that led to that crime is different for all criminals, the commonality is a firearm, and this is what we're seeing time and time again, something that the police are concerned about. They are putting their lives on the line to deal with this, and the community are subjected to this uh, unnecessary harm that can be done. And this is just another example of uh, gun crimes that need to be strengthened when it comes to sentencing to deter others from committing the same crime. Those 23 people are already in custody. If they're convicted, they need to send a message to the next 23 people who are considering purchasing illegal firearms. It's not about gun buybacks and legal gun owners. It's about the thugs on the streets who are having a disregard for public safety. That's what this is about. And that comes from police chiefs, not from me. So back to you guys. All right, well said. Steve Ryan reporting live tonight. Thanks so much for this, Steve. Also making news, police are investigating after shots were fired at a residence in Scarborough overnight. Officers were called to the Scarborough Golf Club Road in Kingston Road area just after midnight. 
A number of bullet holes can be seen outside of a townhouse complex right here. No injuries were reported. I was just in my room watching a movie, and then I just heard bang, 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 like shots being fired. And I got up, looked through my window, but I didn't see anything or anyone. And next thing you know, the police was here. That something happened. Shots were fired, and that was it. And the city is committing uh, to addressing the ratio of police officers to residents with a new hiring plan. Yeah, for a closer look at what this is going to mean and what the idea is all about, let's bring in CB24's Beatrice Baseman tonight. Beatrice. Lena Bakari, you might remember last year uh, there was a very contentious battle between the police chief, the police association, and the mayor and councillors as uh, the chief was asking for a full $20 million in funding uh, last year as it was approved by the Toronto Police Services Board. We're not quite at that process yet. That's going to happen next month. So ahead of it uh, today, the city's budget chief, Shelley Carroll, who sits on the Toronto Police Services Board, uh, put forward a motion. And what this motion does, it essentially uh, sets the plan for a five-year hiring plan for the city of Toronto for the Toronto Police Service. Uh, the chief calling this five-year plan unprecedented and for the first two years of it, uh, Councillor Carroll saying it's essentially front-loaded. The plan is to hire four classes of 90 recruits each in hopes of boosting the cop-to-pop ratio, as they call it, so having more officers on the road uh, for every 100,000 people here in the city. And so here's a bit of what Councillor Shelley Carroll had to say specifically about this plan and what it means. For the following three years, we do agree in principle that what we need is to, to take whatever is the officers per 100,000 population, we like to call that cop to pop, and improve on it based on uh, funding available to us at that time. But that we do agree in principle that we need to keep improving that ratio. I think that should come as good news to community. We have so many things that uh, uh, face our city, uh, special projects that need to be staffed up, um, uh, hate crime unit right now, car theft unit. And so Chief Myron Demke is saying that this five-year hiring plan uh, brings certainty. It's essentially a multi-year commitment, and that's the unprecedented part. Uh, one of the most contentious issues last year in the midst of the actual budget process was the chief saying response times for priority one calls, those are the most urgent 911 calls that come in, was 22 minutes. He wanted more funding to hire more officers to get that down. And at the time, the mayor and various councillors who voted in favour of increasing the police budget says if next year the chief comes back and the response times to uh, priority one calls is still 22 minutes, well, he's going to have to answer to that and can't feasibly ask for more money if there's not actually results being seen. And so I asked the chief today, what is the response time to priority one calls? And of course, his answer is the average. And here's what he said. We are now at about 17 and a half minutes and it's something we continue to watch and continue to make sure we're adjusting our posture as we graduate the next recruit class. We'll look for an inject of young officers again into our frontline service delivery and we'll continue to monitor, that, monitor those numbers closely. So really, today was just one of the first steps in the police budget process. Next month, the Toronto Police Service, the chief, will bring forward uh, its budget in front of the Toronto Police Services Board. At that point, the board will get to vote on it. And then only next year will it be brought before Toronto City Council. And we'll have to wait and see what the plan is, if there's going to be this contentious fight between cops and councillors once again. Back to you. All right, Beatrice Faisman reporting live tonight. Thank you, Beatrice. Well, police are investigating a shooting near Pickering. Chopper 24 was over the scene on Underhill Court. This is near Brock Road and Roslyn Road. A large area has been cordoned off outside of the home. A shooting happened around 1230 this afternoon, leaving a male victim with serious injuries. No suspect information has been released. And York Regional Police are asking for help identifying suspects in a shooting in Markham. Investigators have released this image of the suspected shooter and the vehicle they're looking for. They say a business in the Kennedy Road and Castan Avenue area was hit by gunfire on Saturday. No one was hurt. The shooter left the scene in a blue Honda sedan with silver rims that was driven by someone else. Police believe the incident was targeted. They're asking anybody with information or video from the area 
to come forward. Police have released new video as part of a probe and it rocks being thrown at vehicles in Markham. Yeah, for the latest on the investigation, let's bring in CB24's Phil Perkins. Phil, this is disturbing. It's very disturbing, Lena and Bakari. And as I said last half hour, it's seemingly a disregard for human life. What we're seeing right now is some footage of the aftermath of some of these incidents. There's been 20 thus far since September 20th. This is right at the intersection somewhere in Markham. You can see the car there losing control, running the red light, and then T-boning the vehicle waiting at the intersection. They're not doing this on purpose. The OPP believe that a car traveling in the opposite direction, which is also captured on a dash cam, for some reason threw a rock. And not just, I'm not talking a stone. I'm talking like a, a small boulder the size of a softball or even uh, a, a cantaloupe of some kind through the window into oncoming traffic, hitting the driver, knocking them unconscious. They lose control and they drive through that red light, T-boning the other vehicle, sending two people to hospital with life-threatening Injuries. Again, there's been 20 of these incidents since September 20th, nine of which have been in York Region, the other 11 and on uh, OPP patrolled roads. And we spoke with the OPP about this ongoing investigation. Thankfully, we haven't had any incidents over the last uh, couple of weeks, which uh, which is good. And we're continuing to look at a large amount of information that we have at this time. And we will be relentless in pursuing uh, who's responsible for this. But again, encouraging people to come forward. If you see something suspicious in this area or perhaps have dash camera footage, uh, please make sure that uh, we're made aware of it. And certainly if uh, something like this happens to you in this area, please make sure it's reported. Uh, some of our investigation has determined that we're finding incidents that happened uh, uh, you know, that we didn't even know about. And here's a map of some of the incidents that were reported again, 20 of these and a lot in the same area. And we covered this when it first happened in September and they pointed out that this is uh, a rural road, not, not a lot of street lights there. So very poor visibility if by chance anything was coming your way. On a, on a good day, no one's expecting anything to be thrown at them. Uh, but when it's dark like that, it's very hard to evade something like a stone being thrown right at your window. So again, uh, if you have any information, contact York Regional Police or the OPP to try to try to find whoever's behind this. Back to you too. That is okay. wild. Yeah, CB24 is Phil Perkins. Thank you. An elderly woman's fighting for her life in hospital after being hit by a vehicle in Toronto's East End. The woman was hit shortly after 9 o'clock this morning in the Danforth and Greenwood area. Paramedics say she was transported to a trauma center with life-threatening injuries. Police tell us the vehicle that hit her remained at the scene. There's no word yet if the driver will be facing charges. It's 5, 12, 6 degrees. Let's get a check on the commute at 5 o'clock with cb 24 traffic specialist, Adjwa and Tia Adj. Yeah, we have a, quite a problem that it's impacting the commute for commuters on the southbound lanes of the 400. Just a stall transport truck, but MTOs arrived on scene and they are blocking the three left lanes. No heavy tow as of yet, but they put pylons in place, which means this is going to be there for some time. So southbound 400, which is usually isn't this bad at this time of day, very slow from before Finch. Once you get onto the 401, you're into rush hour traffic. It's slow across the top of the city and barely moving. It is jam solid. Nothing but brake lights on the westbound Gardner exiting the downtown core from Cherry to Dufferin. Outside of camera view, if you're headed towards Oshawa, Rosalind uh, Road is closed at Simcoe, and that is where a serious collision in Oshawa. I'll send it back to you. This CP24 traffic report is brought to you by 407 ETR. Enjoy the journey with a stress-free commute. Thanks so much, Adwa. It's 513, 6 degrees. You're watching Live at 5. Coming up, the annual Who's Hungry report has been released. And in the past year, there are nearly 3.5 million visits to food banks in the city. That's almost a million more visits than the year before. Welcome back. A new report shows food insecurity has reached staggering new heights in Toronto. Yeah, there were almost three and a half million visits to food banks in the city over the last year. This is according to the annual Who's Hungry report from the Daily Bread and North York Harvest. That's almost one million more visits than the year prior and a 273 percent increase from pre-pandemic levels. The report also shows that more than one in 10 Torontonians rely on food banks. 57 percent of clients surveyed say the cost of living is their main reason for visiting a food bank. In the meetings we have with elected officials, we, we talk about what's going on in their ward or their riding, and we speak about their alarming statistics there. Then we give them the policy solutions, um, and, uh, and then they put their arm around us and they say, you're doing a great job as, uh, as they lead us out to the, uh, the, the door. 
And, and that's got to stop. As Sarah, Sarah mentioned, we want to be able to work with all levels of government and all parties to say what are the real policy solutions that will begin to reduce the number of individuals who are food insecure. There are 8.6 million Canadians who are food insecure. Um, 155,000 Torontonians who came to the food bank for the first time. That's unacceptable. And we have the solutions to be able to mitigate that. The spirit of food banks is neighbours helping neighbours, community care. And that's a beautiful thing. But at this level, at this level, it is a clear sign of systems failure. Our support systems and our social safety nets have been allowed to fray to such a level that people are not falling through the cracks. The ground is collapsing beneath their feet. We are at a breaking point as the government relies on our mutual aid, charity and food bank agencies to solve this problem. There is one very real solution and that is to invest in affordable housing. That's deeply affordable housing, non-profit, co-op, supportive and social housing. Because it's one thing to say that, you know, it's a, it's a food insecurity crisis and it is. But the food insecurity crisis is fueled and led by the housing crisis in our province. The report shows that there were nearly 155,000 people who started making use of food bank services for the first time. That's up more than 200% compared to two years ago and a more than fourfold increase from before the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, city and federal officials have marked the creation of 92 permanent supportive homes downtown. Yeah, the former Bond Place Hotel on Dundas East. It was previously used as a temporary shelter during the pandemic. It was purchased by the city with funding from the Federal Rapid Housing Initiative to convert to affordable and rent geared to income housing. The renovated building includes a new studio and one bedroom apartments with a private bathroom and kitchenette. At least 15% of the apartments are accessible. And residents also have access to a laundry, dining area and tenant support spaces. 80 plus 90 people that was homeless, they might be they may have slept in a tent for two winters at Allen's Garden, or they may have come in from the ravine. They now have a roof over the head. They now have a washroom. They now a warm inside, which means that they can get back up on their feet. It means that they can also get the counseling and the support that they may need. And they could cook together. They could eat together. They could form a community together. This project is the largest shelter to housing conversion ever undertaken in our city. Right now it's 519, five degrees. This is Lab at Five. Well, coming up, ground has been broken on his new skilled trades campus in Ora Medonte. We'll tell you more next. Welcome back. Ahead of a possible early election in Ontario, Liberal leader Bonnie Crombie is promising to cut taxes if elected. She made the announcement in Scarborough this morning. Take a look. Doug Ford thinks a one-time $200 check makes up for the cost of living crisis that he created. Well, I disagree. So today I'm here to announce that when I'm Premier, I'm going to stop the giveaways to Doug's friends and cut your taxes instead. As Premier, I'll immediately do two things to put more money back into your pockets. First, I'll cut your income taxes. And then, I'll get rid of the sales tax on home heating and hydro bills. Premier Doug Ford responded to Crombie's announcement in Oral Medante today. Bonnie Crombie gave the people of Mississauga the largest tax increase in the history of Mississauga. I know my good friend Hazel is probably spinning around right now because they actually shrunk Mississauga in a population boom because people were moving out because of the high taxes. Bonnie Crombie, her announcement today, won't even give you a fraction back of what we're giving back to the, the people in January with a rebate check of $200. Now, Crombie says the proposed tax cuts will save middle-class families in this province about $1,150 every year. Well, the province is investing nearly $5 million in a new training facility for operating engineers 
north of Barrie. Yeah, the Premier and Labor Minister David Piccini were in Oro Medante this morning at a groundbreaking ceremony for the new campus of the Operating Engineers Training Institute of Ontario. That training facility will cost $25 million. Right out to 523, 5 degrees, feeling like one above zero. This is Live at 5. Well, coming up, Taylor Swift fans are lining up outside Rogers Centre two days before her first show here. We'll tell you why next. Starting today, Taylor Swift fans in Toronto can finally get their hands on official Eras Tour merch. Yeah, let's go live now to CB24's Melissa Duggan, who once again joins us from outside Rogers Centre. Uh, this time, a lot of fans uh, lining up all day. Melissa, have you had a chance to look at any of the merch? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? Listen, Lino, what a change from this time yesterday. This is Taylor Swift Central. We're seeing all sorts of fans with all of their brand new merchandise, like this crew. Come on over. What have we got? We're showing off what's available at the Taylor Swift merchandise shop. Three different gates where it's available. Uh, you wanted to show it all off, so tell me what you got here. I got a hoodie and it was super cute. They have it in a bunch of different colors, a bunch of different sweaters. I got this tapestry so it can be right above my bed. Oh, it's very cool. And what do we have over here? I love the poster. Yeah, Taylor Swift uh, poster for my niece, um, who's a huge Taylor Swift fan, and she's eight years old. Uh, they were sold out of the blue crew top. They had some this morning, but supposed to have more tomorrow morning. Okay, and are you going to be seeing the concerts? I am on Thursday. Terrific. I'm so excited. Section 200. <laughs> Shout out to Taylor Swift if you happen to be looking up in that area. As you can tell, a lot of excitement right now. I've been talking to other Swifties too. Here's what they're telling me. It means a lot for me. You're just like, nothing she says. I'm really pretty. I'm mad on everybody. It's like, it's so exciting. It's like, when I see Toronto, we don't like this huge, like, Taylor Swift Center. I want another one of these. <laughs> With because I went to Seattle night too, so I need one with new dates on it. Can I see the back? Terrific. Okay, so why did you pick this one out? Because I like the color and of course Taylor Swift. Of course Taylor Swift. Why are you such a fan of Taylor Swift? She is an inspiration. It, uh, you can look on the website to be 24. Okay, now we do see police presence outside of Rogers Centre right now. We do know that the City of Toronto has activated their Emergency Operations Centre for the days where the concerts are taking place. Uh, that gives them a way to uh, have better communication with all their different resources, make sure everyone is safe, because we are expecting some half a million people to be travelling to Toronto for these six sold out concerts. And one more thing I want to show you, Lena and Bakari, because this is pretty exciting. Behind us here is the parking lot. And I was talking with a security guy and he said, yeah, we are seeing these big trucks pull in here. I asked him, is this part of the equipment for the concert series? He said, yes. So the wheels are in motion to bring Taylor Swift to town. Back to you. Yeah, security is tight, that's for sure. And it's starting to feel very real. Uh, Melissa Duggan, live in downtown Toronto tonight. Thanks so much, Melissa. It's 529, five degrees you're watching. Live at five. As we say, nearly 100 shots were fired outside of a recording studio. Some hit an unmarked police cruiser with officers inside. A hundred shots fired outside a recording studio near Queen and Dufferin. Nearly two dozen people arrested, 16 guns seized. The city is committing to a hiring plan for police officers. We're going to have more on what that could mean straight ahead. And we are live outside the Rogers Center. It's the first day the fans can buy merchandise from Taylor Swift to Eras Tour ahead of the first show. That's Thursday. You're watching Live at Five. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lena Latifast. I'm Bakari Savage. Police have seized more than a dozen firearms, arresting 23 people. This is after a wild shootout near Queen and Dufferin. Yeah, it happened outside a recording studio, and by chance, police were in the area when the gunfire erupted. Let's get right to our crime analyst, Steve Ryan, tonight, who's been keeping a really close eye on the story. Steve. Yeah, Alina, it was some terrific police work by the uh, Toronto Police to get here as quickly as they did. And not only get here, but 
identified uh, 23 suspects, arrested those 23 people, uh, dodged 100 bullets that were uh, being fired at this location in the alleyway and inside, uh, so I, I'm told, of uh, this address on uh, the north side of Queen Street near Northcote. It is, as you said, a recording studio, and uh, this is where several of the guns were seized last night, and others were found in garbage bins as people fled on foot, and they were discarding uh, their firearms uh, so they wouldn't be caught with them, but the police were able to seize 23 guns. The FIS uh, officer spent a good part of the day here today going through this uh, scene itself, taking pictures and collecting uh, forensic evidence. And as the uh, chief said, uh, as he addressed the police services board today, this investigation is far from uh, far from over. But sadly, what we have seen again is uh, blatant disregard for public safety in a very busy spot. This is a spot that's uh, not it's used to rather uh, foot traffic and there are cars passing through here at all hours of the uh, night and day and 11:20 last night 100 shots fired and by the grace of god nobody was injured uh, by gunfire now the mayor did make a statement today she spoke about this occurrence last night and i spoke with a witness as well who saw everything from her condo window now here's more from the two of them let's have a listen i spoke to the chief before arriving here and um, I extended my uh, gratitude for his officer acting swiftly and that no one was hurt in terms of the officers. And um, the situation is evolving. There's more investigation going on. And he is going to have a press conference quite soon. What I heard as I lied in bed and I heard bang, 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 bang. And... I never heard gunshot before, but when it did it again, bang, bang, and then I realized that's got to be gunshot. Then when I looked out my window, I saw a black van on North Coat, North Coat here, the street, and all the windshield was blown out. Now, the chief said today, uh, as he addressed the police services board, that uh, he is calling on the feds to uh, impose tougher sentences when it comes to uh, gun crimes being committed. Uh, and he's calling on a bail to be reformed as well uh, so that repeat offenders aren't out committing these same offenses over and over again. And he has said what many law enforcement uh, officials have said to me over this past couple of years. So remember, sentencing uh, for a gun crime is not just about punishment. It's about deterring other people from committing that offense. When a, a person is sentenced, the deed is done. Somebody's already been harmed, either physically or psychologically, but you want to send that message to other people that if you commit that crime, you're going to go away for a long period of time. That's not what's happening right now, and the police have an uphill battle. Oftentimes, they're arresting the same people over and over again, and we're seeing more situations like this where people are uh, put in danger out in the public because of this blatant disregard for public safety. And things need to change when it comes to the legislation, when it comes to enforcing the law, and that's what Chief Demke said today. I'll send it back to you guys. Okay, near the scene of this wild shootout at Queen, or near Queen in Dufferin, CP24's crime analyst, Steve Ryan. Thanks, Steve. And police are investigating after shots were fired this time at a residence in Scarborough. It happened overnight. Yeah, officers were called to the Scarborough Golf Club Road and Kingston Road area just after midnight. Numerous bullet holes can be seen on the outside of a townhouse complex. No injuries were reported. It was scary because, you know, it could be any one of us. And even now I'm a little fearful of even doing this because you just never know what would happen. Timid scared, you know, because I work afternoons and I come in at nights, so you just never know. Yeah, because it's really close to home, so I'm just glad my neighbors are okay. And the city's committing to addressing the ratio of police officers to residents with a new hiring plan. Yeah, CB24's Beatrice Vaisman is following that story. So what is this going to mean, Beatrice? Well, Lena, this is an agreement now uh, by uh, essentially the Toronto Police Services Board, a board on which uh, the budget chief for this city sits. She brought forward a motion uh, to set forward a five-year hiring plan for the Toronto Police Service. It's front-loaded, so the first two years of 2025 and 2026 uh, sees a commitment from the city essentially to uh, fund two, uh, pardon me, four classes of 90 recruits each time. And then from there, the 
back end three years. It's an agree in principle to improve the cop to pop ratio. That's to improve the number of police officers in uniform on the streets for every 100,000 Torontonians. It comes ahead of the budget process for the Toronto Police Service. If you remember last year, it was a contentious one. We'll get to that in just a second, but here's more from Budget Chief Shelley Carroll. Well, today we have one of the, the uh, um, lowest uh, uh, cop to pop ratios measured against all other North American cities. We're starting today to do everything we can to improve it. And so that means those four classes of 90 are meant to cover retirements, then meant to, to make sure that we're continuing that ratio despite the city's growth, and then to improve on it so that over time, over the course of the five-year hiring plan, we're really improving on the number of officers per 100,000 in our population. When it comes to that contentious battle last year between the Toronto Police Chief, Myron Demke, the Toronto Police Association, uh, and the mayor and councillors, I mean, back then the uh, chief wanted $20 million increase to his budget. The mayor initially offered $12 million less than that, and so they kind of went loggerheads. And one of the chief uh, points that the chief brought forward was the fact that the uh, response times for priority 911 calls, the most urgent 911 calls, domestic violence in progress, a shooting, a home invasion, things like that that require immediate attention was 22 minutes. The chief today is saying it's down to an average of 17.5 minutes. As for the Toronto Police Association, I asked uh, the new head of the association if he plans to go head to head once again with the mayor, with the Toronto Police Services Board, with the decision makers when it comes to funding. And here's a bit of what he, he had to say, not only about the process, uh, but also the response times and how challenging it has become to retain officers for TPS. We are now at about 17 and a half minutes and it's something we continue to watch and continue to make sure we're adjusting our posture as we graduate the next recruit class. We'll look for an inject of young officers again into our frontline service delivery and we'll continue to monitor, that, monitor those numbers closely. First two years I'm excited about in that we're going to keep mass hiring going, which is four full classes through the Ontario Police College. We desperately need it. Response times are still, as the chief mentioned, at 17 and a half minutes. But the bigger issue is we don't have a current collective agreement in place. And to keep and retain officers here in the city is going to be near to impossible. They're going to go to other services. So it's kind of a pie in the sky idea. We need to make sure we have a collective agreement in place to keep these officers here. So that's part of the concern in terms of increasing cop to pop ratio. If you've got officers leaving to Barry, to Peel, to York, to Peterborough, to wherever, it makes it a challenge to retain officers here for the Toronto Police Service. But as for the budget process, in December, the chief in the Toronto Police Service will bring forward its budget to the Toronto Police Services Board. If that's approved, it then goes essentially to the mayor and city councillors to consider as part of the overall city budget. Back to you. All right, Beatrice, thanks so much for this. Time now is 540. Five degrees. Let's get a check on that. Drive home, Adjoa and Siebois. Keeping a close eye on that. How's it going, Adj? Still very slow, and now we're not seeing any sunshine because the sun set, but problems are still lingering. Uh, Lena, on the southbound lanes of the 400, this is right around Shepherd. The stall, uh, just an MTO crew remains. It was a transport. It might be just out at camera view. Left lane is blocked. At least they managed to reopen the two center lanes that were also off limits. If you're on the 401 and you're traveling on the westbound side, you're looking at a very, very slow drive uh, from before the DVP. It continues slow all the way out towards Kipling. Eastbound 401 also, it's a slow as well as you head uh, from the 427 out to the 400. A lot of these cameras just went out. Cameras that are working are on the DVP and you're not really moving this hour as you make your way from Bayview Bloor and you continue all the way up towards the 401. If your travels take you towards Oshawa, Roslyn Road remains closed uh, just as you make your way through Simcoe, and that is for an ongoing serious collision. I'll send it back to you both. All right, thanks, Adj. You're welcome. Right now it's 541, five degrees. This is Lab 5. Coming up, the annual Who's Hungry report has been released, and in the past year, there were nearly three and a half million visits to food banks in the city. We're gonna take a closer look at the numbers next. <music> A new report shows food insecurity has reached staggering new heights in Toronto. Now, there were almost three and a half million visits to food banks in the city over the last year. This is according to the annual Who's Hungry report from the Daily Bread and North York Harvest. That's almost one million more visits than the year prior and a 273% increase from pre-pandemic levels. The report also shows 
that more than one in 10 Torontonians rely on food banks. 57% of clients surveyed say the cost of living is their main reason for visiting a food bank. Each year we come to you with this report and we get asked what should be done? How do we solve this? And for years, years, the answers have been the same. It's not about building a better food bank. People need affordable housing. People need access to decent work that pays a living wage. And people need social assistance rates that don't leave them in legislated poverty. Until we see these things, the situation will not change. We cannot keep asking the same question and expect a different answer. If it was just one thing, it would be act now. We, we, know, we, know, we know what's going on. It's been going on for a long time. This number should cause every politician to lose sleep, get gray hair, and act. Now, the report shows there were nearly 155,000 people who started making use of food bank services for the first time. That's up more than 200 percent compared to two years ago and a more than fourfold increase from before the COVID pandemic. It's 545, five degrees. This is Live at Five. Canada Post workers, they could walk off the job by the end of this week. More on how this could impact consumers with the holidays and Black Friday right around the corner. Well, Labor Minister Stephen McKinnon says he is inter intervening to end the work stoppages at ports in B.C., and Montreal. Yeah, he says that the negotiations have reached an impasse and he's directing the Canada Industrial Relations Board to order the resumption of all operations and move the talks to binding arbitration. McKinnon says that the work stoppages at the ports of BC and Port of Montreal are significantly impacting supply chains, thousands of jobs, as well as Canada's reputation as a reliable trading partner. And Canada Post could be hit by a strike before the end of this week. The Canadian Union of Postal Workers has issued a 72-hour strike notice, so job action could begin on Friday. The union says it'll depend on what happens at the bargaining table in the next few days. The union rejected the latest offer from Canada Post, which included annual wage increases of 11.5% over four years. And Jan Simpson, the national president of Cup W, says that union representatives they're ready and willing to negotiate a fair deal. Canada Post would need to come to the table and actually try to negotiate, you know, for real, true demands. We're trying our best to negotiate a contract because we know arbitrated contracts are not good for anyone. They need to come to the table with real solutions for their concerns as well as for our concerns. So that's the latest from the union. Alice here from Canada Post tonight. A spokesperson says they'll try to maintain some form of mail delivery in the event of a strike. What we've seen in the past is a rotating strike, uh, where you take parts of our facilities, uh, of our network down over time, um, and for short periods of time. That's what we've seen in the past. So we want uh, Canadians to know that, uh, first, we're con committed to continuing to negotiate uh, a fair agreement. But at the same time, we're going to do everything possible to continue uh, to maintain service with our, with our employees. So there may be some delays, different parts of our network, if it goes to rotating strikes, um, obviously would have an impact. Uh, but it's our intention to maintain service to Canadians. And with more on how this could impact businesses and consumers, we're now joined by retail analyst and author Bruce Winder. Bruce, good to see you tonight. Thank you for joining us. Look, the timing here could not be worse. Black Friday coming up, the holidays right around the corner. How do you think this is going to impact people ahead of the holidays? Yeah, it's going to, the timing is obviously poor, and I know that's by design, right, to get the greatest leverage uh, in the bargaining process. But yeah, it's going to hurt small businesses a lot. Small businesses use Canada Post a lot to ship parcels out from their e-commerce websites. It's also going to hurt consumers who are looking to send gifts to loved ones around the country as well. Okay, so Bruce, along those lines, we've got to talk about options. As consumers, as small business owners, what options besides Canada Post do people have for shipping and receiving packages, gifts? Well, you're going to have to use a courier probably, you know, like FedEx, UPS, DHL. Uh, it's going to cost you a little more probably, but, um, you know, that's probably your best bet if you have to move product in a quick period of time. Uh, is there any advice in terms of um, giving yourself extra time ahead of the holidays? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, I would want to see what's going to happen Thursday night at midnight with this yeah. situation. But, yeah, it's always good to work a little early, right, particularly when supply chains are a little congested. I mean, we're also coming off the port strikes 
in uh, Montreal, Quebec, and Vancouver. So that's going to affect uh, retailers and consumers as well as retailers and manufacturers try to get merchandise flowing again now that that's going to uh, binding arbitration. Okay, so Bruce, looking at all of this, you know, the situation with the ports, uh, the, situ the issue with Canada Post, should people maybe consider shifting shopping to brick and mortar stores, going in person, getting what they can get right then and there? That could be one option for sure, is just going in and getting something. I mean, if you're waiting for a package, that would take that out of the equation, definitely. It's one option that people could look at, is just going into a store and bring the parcel home with you, for sure. You talked about the port strikes in B.C. and Montreal. We now know the federal government is intervening there. Um, do you think the federal government could take a similar route if it comes to that here as well? I do. I think so. I mean, I think that... The federal government has shown with the last couple of strikes that they're willing to intervene and send both parties to arbitration. And, um, you know, I think Canadians are going to face a lot of political pressure to do something, especially if the Canada Post strike occurs and for every day it occurs, they're going to feel more pressure to legislate them or to send them to binding arbitration. And, and can we just talk about what the backlog might look like um, if we are in fact seeing, you know, port strikes in BC and Montreal and then this Canada Post strike, what would that look like and what would that impact look like? Yeah, it's going to be pretty ugly. I mean, when you think about it, if you look at the ports alone, they do about $1.2 billion a day in trade. And, you know, depending on which port you're talking about, some of them have been off for a few days now, if not weeks. So it does take several days, if not weeks, to catch up on some of those, depending on the backlog. And that means that you'll probably see some empty shelves on stores in December. Mm. And you may see some uh, deliveries uh, late as well from an e-commerce perspective. Okay, retail analyst and author, Bruce Winder. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks a lot. It's 553, 5 degrees. This is Live at 5. Coming up, Taylor Swift fans are lining up outside the Rogers Center two days before her first show here. CB24's Melissa Duggan is live down there talking to fans and uh, scoping out the merch. Starting today, Taylor Swift fans in Toronto can finally get their hands on official Eras Tour merchandise. Yeah, and for a look at what that looks like, let's bring in ZB24's Melissa Duggan, who's outside Rogers Centre, where fans have been lining up all day. Before we get talking about the merch, I want to talk about one fan who is really emotional today, <laughs> Melissa. Like, really emotional. I know. I know, such a sweetheart. You know what's been so great out here, Lena, is being able to talk to these Taylor Swift fans. A lot of them being emotional. We saw one crying a little bit earlier. And so many of them just so eager to talk to us. And they're all just hanging out here, taking photos. Hello, Taylor Swift fans, how's it going? Listen, they're already having the blast, and it is just the eve of the eve of Taylor, first, Taylor Swift's first of six sold out shows here. And as you mentioned, merchandise, it is now up for grabs. So the stores are open at three gates here at Rogers Center, gate one, gate five, gate nine A. And that's where you can pick up things like t-shirts, like posters, that sort of thing until eight o'clock tonight. It opens up again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. And when there aren't concerts, that's when you can come and check it out yourself. You're able to get into Rogers Center to buy this, even if you don't have a ticket on those days when we don't have concerts. Now, there is just a whole operation underway to make sure that this is all safe. We heard from Toronto's uh, Chief of Police, Myron Demke, earlier. He was asked about the planning for this massive event. Here's what he had to say. We are incredibly excited for the Taylor Swift shows to be here. We are doing everything possible, working with organizers, stadium personnel, um, the City of Toronto, uh, various departments to ensure a safe and enjoyable set of evenings and events in our city. Uh, and importantly, uh, to encourage people to come and enjoy uh, the show and, and celebrate what is a great occasion for us. Something else that's really cool right now at Rogers Centre too, they're actually blaring Taylor Swift music uh, from the stadium and also the trucks that are parked over here carrying equipment for the concert, they're also playing Taylor Swift music. And something I want to show you, Lena and Bakari, I mentioned just how fabulous Taylor Swift fans have been to talk to here over the last couple of days. They're also really generous too. 
I got my very first friendship bracelet from just a sweetheart that just happened to pop by. It says fearless on one of them. So Aww. I certainly appreciate That's that. So, uh, so a very friendly nice. place to be if you happen to come down. All right, there she is. Sp24's so nice. <laughs> Melissa Duggan, yeah. now officially a Swifty. Thanks a lot. Your it's first 59. friendship bracelet. That looks so great on you, Mel. Thanks so much. It's 59. This is Toronto's Breaking News, CP24. Thanks for watching. CTV News at 6 is next.